on April 14, 1521, Martin Luther was on his way to the Diet of Worms. In English, it looks like the Diet of Worms. You wonder what kind of a banquet that is. <laughs> Fisherman's banquet. <laughs> And Luther's life was in great danger. His closest friend, whose name was George Spalatin, he sent Luther a, a message telling him, don't go to Ferns. This is because if you go to Ferns, you're going to suffer the same fate as John Huss. John Huss was an earlier uh, reformer, long before uh, Martin Luther. He was burned at the stake. Luther said to his friend, Though Huss was burned, the truth was not burned, and Christ still lives. Luther decided to go to Worms, even though his friends urged him not to go. Now, the day after he arrived in Worms on April the 17th, Luther stood before the Emperor uh, Charles. And, and also the Archbishop of Trier, whose name was Johann Eck. I don't expect you to remember those names. And Johann Eck told him to deny all of his books and all of his writings, to denounce them as being true. <clears throat> Luther asked for another day to consider it, and on April the 18th, Luther stood and courageously announced before the emperor and all the people that were there, he said, and I quote, unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. And that became one of the greatest moments in modern in the modern history of the world. And the Reformation had begun. Now, how did Martin Luther <clears throat> come to this place where it did not matter about his own life? But he would stand before the whole world, risking his life for the sake of God's truth. And I say to you that I think that the reason is, is because Luther knew God's will. He knew it by examining God's work as a monk in Wittenberg. He knew it when he was on his knees climbing Pilate's staircase in the city of Rome. And when he got to the top, he said, No, it is the just are saved by faith, not by penance. He knew it was God's will for him to go to Verbs and declare the truth to the world, even though it might cost him his life. When we come to our text today, we, we're going to find the Apostle Paul in a similar situation in which he knows that it is God's will that he goes to Jerusalem. He knows that. And he is making every attempt to get there. And yet he's constantly hitting walls after wall after wall, trying to discourage him from going. We may wonder sometimes what is God's will for us. Or sometimes we know what God's will and we struggle with the power to do it. So the story of Paul's struggle offers us some very helpful insights into following God's will for us. So I've titled this message, Following God's Will. I don't know what it is about the dog and the, and the, and the, the projections. Those are light changes. Yeah. So our text is uh, Acts chapter 21, uh, verses 1 to 16. And we've already read it, so I'm not going to read it again. But in this text, what we, come to, we realize is that Paul had just 
experienced a tearful goodbye with the Ephesian elders in chapter 19. Uh, and it was a tearful uh, goodbye because the, they really believed that they would never see Paul again. They said, you're going to go to Jerusalem and something's going to happen to you and we will never see you again. Paul was heading to Jerusalem before he went to Rome and Spain. That was his ultimate plan. This is what he believed was God's plan for him. Now we need to back up a little bit here and go to chapter 19, verse 21. Because this is where Paul actually first announces um, what he believes God's plan is for him and what God's will is. So when we talk about God's plan and God's will, these are actually the same thing. Okay. You know, when I, was, uh, when I was a young pastor, and, uh, uh, and, and I was in charge of youth programs in the church, the number one question that young people always have, and they still have it, is, how do I know what God's will is? Right? And sometimes we ask it, but you know what? It's really the easiest thing in the world. And we're going to see why that is this morning. So here in Acts chapter 19, verse 21, Paul announces his intentions to go to Jerusalem. Look at it, verse 21. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So he's staying in Asia for a while, then he's going to go up to Macedonia, which is where Thessalonica is and Philippi is. So he's going to see those churches. Remember, they're just really young churches. He's going to make sure that everything is okay there. But he's already sent Timothy and Erasmus there ahead of him. Then he's going to pick up those guys, and then he's going to go down to Corinth, uh, and then grab a ship and go to Jerusalem. That's his plan best laid plans, right? This, of course, is about six months earlier to our text in chapter 21. So it was in Paul, this is Paul's intention. And as it turned out, while he was in Corinth, he heard about a plan by the Jews, or a plot by the Jews, to kill him when he got on board the ship. You know, these were not believing Jews, these were unbelieving Jews. Right? We can believe that, right? Mm -hmm. Remember how Paul and Luke has been picturing the Jews here to, um, uh, to um, who did he write the book to again? Theophilus. Theophilus, yes. To Theophilus. You mean Luke? Luke. What did I say? Paul. Did I say Paul? No. No? 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 I mean, I, did, I know that I can mess up. <laughs> I didn't think I did. Uh, so you know, Luke is trying to give the Christians a favorable look to the Romans, um, and part of the way he does that is by showing how all of the problems that are existing and the troubles that are happening in Rome are because of the Jews and not because of the Christians. So, <clears throat> Paul hears of this plot of the Jews to kill him on board the ship. That's in chapter 20, verse 3. Okay? So, Paul plans, his plans are interrupted. So, he's not going to get to Jerusalem when he thought he was going to be able to get there. So what he does is they half of their, the guys get on the ship, and uh, Paul and half of his uh, followers, they head back up to, to Thessalonica and to Philippi. <clears throat> and while he's in Philippi, he catches a boat there and goes across the Aegean Sea to Troas. That's in uh, 20 verse 6. He spends about a week there, and then he boards a ship um, and goes down to Miletus, which is 20 verse 16. And this is where he has the meets up with the elders from Ephesus, and they have their tearful goodbye, which is, brings us to the start again of chapter 21. When he departs from them, the Ephesian elders, and they set sail one more time. But he's about three weeks in Melita. So all of his plans are being delayed and, and uh, disrupted by, by plots and ships and, and, uh, and cargoes and 
uh, all these things that he has no control of. One of the things that he could think is that, hey, my life is out of control. Do you think Paul really thought that? No. And sometimes we're tempted to, to start thinking that way when, when everything, I mean, we all have periods of time when our lives seem to be in disarray. And, and we can't seem to, to, to do the things that we want to do. And there's all kinds of interruptions. But we should never think that our life is out of control. Because it is always in control. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So here in Miletus, they have their fearful goodbye with the elders from Ephesus. Luke even mentions that Paul was anxious to get to Jerusalem. Look at uh, chapter 20, verse 16. In verse 16, he says, For Paul has decided to sail past Ephesus. Right? He didn't want to stop in Ephesus to say goodbye. He was going to sail past Ephesus so that he might have, uh, not have time to spend in Asia, for he was hastening. He was wanting to get to Jerusalem. He wanted to be there because that's where he believed that God wanted him to be. And if possible, he wanted to be there by the, by the day of Pentecost. Now, he had another interruption, because his stay in Miletus, the ship docked there, <laughs> And uh, they spent several days loading and unloading more cargo. Uh, today when we book uh, passage, uh, either on a bus or a train or an airplane or a book, I mean, the itinerary is completely laid out. We know exactly where we will be at what time and, and how long it will be when we get to the end. But back then, obviously, they didn't have that. So they didn't have privilege to know that when they grabbed this boat, it was going to end up in Miletus for several days. And, and so Paul expresses this frustration to the Ephesian elders. Look at chapter 20, verse 22. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So Paul is bound. That's what this word constrained means. It's, it's the same word as being bound by a rope or, or by handcuffs. Right? Uh, you can't get out of it. I mean, once, once you're bound by that thing, you're going, you've got to uh, do what it wants to do. And he's talking about being bound by his uh, conscience, uh, compelled by his convictions. And his conviction is that I've got to get to Jerusalem. And he can't get that out of his mind. So he, he's doing everything he can to get there, but he's meeting frustration after frustration uh, along the way. Now, there's, there's different opinions about this verse as to whether or not he is constrained within his own spirit, small s, or whether it is the Holy Spirit, capital S. Now, most uh, English Bibles, I think, Translated with a capital S. Anybody have a small s in the translation? And, and uh, we, we know definitely that later on uh, it is the Holy Spirit because it specifically says the Holy Spirit. But here it's just the Spirit. Now, some people will say that because the definite article is in the Greek that it means the Spirit, uh, the specific Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but either way, it doesn't really matter, because whether it is by his own spirit that he's constrained to go to Jerusalem, or by the Holy Spirit, uh, the message is that his own spirit would be constrained because of the Holy Spirit. So he's convinced that this is God's will, that God's will is that he's got to get to Jerusalem, and he's constrained by that desire to follow God's will, and he's going to go there, no matter what. And nothing's going to stop him or get in his way. It's going to delay him. But nothing is going to keep him from getting there. Paul believes it to be God's will that he go to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so he's compelled and driven to obey and do God's will. And the verse tells us that he, uh, <clears throat> tells us that he doesn't know what will happen when he gets there. Sometimes we read that wrong, uh, 
Okay, uh, sometimes we, we think that it's saying that the Spirit is testifying that he will have imprisonment and infliction when he gets there. Okay, it's not saying that. It's say, he says that he knows from the Holy Spirit that every city that he goes to, and when he looks back at his own experience that every city he has been to, what's he had? He's had imprisonment and affliction. So he expects that when he goes to Jerusalem this will happen. He doesn't know for certain but this is his experience and probably his expectation. But that's not going to deter him. Why? Because he knows to go to Jerusalem is God's, God's will. And look at what it says there in verse 24 of chapter 20. Why does he go? Because Jesus has given the task of taking the gospel of the grace of God to all the people. Now this is going all the way back to Acts chapter 9, that is conversion, in verse 15 and 16, where Jesus said to him, through Ananias, the Lord said to him, Go, he told Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Jews and Gentiles. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Paul knew that suffering was going to be part of following God. So that brings us right up to date to chapter 21. And in the first three, look at the first three verses. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kaz. And the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargoes. So leaving the elders of the church of Ephesus in Miletus, they get on a boat, they set sail, and uh, they uh, endure a, a routine journey that's filled with time-consuming stops uh, on the way to the port of Patera. In verse 1, where they book a passage for a non-stop 400 mile uh, voyage to land a tire. Now, if this is one of those things, verses where you should automatically go to the back of your Bible if you have maps, right? And uh, you should be able to find a map that has Paul's third journey and be able to see uh, how this maps out because it's really helpful to have this image in your mind. So I, I've put it briefly here on the on the. Uh, the, the board. So we see there's Ephesus and uh, there's Miletus. He catches it in Miletus. He goes to Kos. They stop. They unload and load cargo. Pick up some more passengers. They go around to Rhodes, which is an island. And again, they have uh, a delay. And uh, finally, they end up at Patera, which is the port where they entered on their first journey. Oh, no, sorry, I'm wrong there. Sorry, uh, it's not the, the, the port where they entered on the first journey. That's the next bump over. Uh, this is, is where he entered on his first journey. Don't mean to confuse you. <laughs> okay, so he's at Materia. This is where he's going to catch his point. If you follow the yellow line, he goes by and passes Cyprus, which is the big island there on his left, and ends up in Tyre. So you see it uh, uh, where it is. Okay. And uh, now he's in Tyre, and he has another delay. Well, they get off the boat there, and he decides that since he's got to spend some time there, he's going to go visit the Christians. And so look at 21, verse 4. And having sought out the disciples, the church that's there at Tyre, we stayed there for seven days. I'm sure that he didn't want us to do that, but um, they did. Now, remember back in Miletus, that's when, remember they, they split their half, Paul and half of the men went north to, to Philippi, and the other, Luke and uh, the other half of the men got on that ship, and they ended up in, all of them ended up in Miletus, and they joined together, and then, so they're all together now in Tyre. So this is what Luke talks about when he says, the we. So having sought out the disciples, verse 4, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul, what were they telling him? Don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. 
Now, sometimes we look at this and we say, can't Paul get it through his head? He's not supposed to go to Jerusalem. I mean, everything is against him getting there. And even the believers and his, his uh, traveling companions are all telling him, don't go to Jerusalem. So his trip is delayed for another seven days, and the Christians in Tyre tell him not to go to Jerusalem. And, and Luke tells us that it was through the Spirit that they're telling him not to go. Do you see that in that verse? Verse 4? It's through the Spirit. Well, how, how much more do you need? Hey, Paul, I'm telling you, I got this straight from the Spirit of God himself. You don't go to Jerusalem. Now, we need to understand what does this mean when it says uh, through the Spirit. Okay. We need to understand here that the Spirit did not tell them to tell Paul that he should not go to Jerusalem. You notice that? It's not what it said there. The Spirit did not say, tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem. There's no doubt that Paul believed it was God's will that he goes to Jerusalem. So what does it mean then when they say through the Spirit? Well, it really means this. It means that the Spirit told them that Paul was going to have uh, undergo suffering for Christ when he gets to Jerusalem. And, and, and if you understand that the Spirit of God tells you, hey, when Paul gets there, he's going to have some suffering. What would you want to say as the friend of Paul? We want to save you from this, Paul. Don't go. Don't go unless you absolutely have to. We don't want anything to happen to you. It's, you see, it's out of their love and their care and concern. So it's not the Holy Spirit telling them, tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Otherwise, Paul would be what? He'd be disobeying the Spirit of God, wouldn't he? He already knows, and we've already seen in the verses, that Paul is convinced. He knows what God's will is, and he's going to follow it. The Spirit predicted persecution against the Apostle, and the people's love for Paul caused them to beg him not to go. But it doesn't end there. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, they arrive at Ptolemais. And then the next day, verse 8, they arrive at Caesarea, where he encounters again more opposition to his going to Jerusalem. Look at verse 8. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, um, who was one of the seven. So that's referring back to Acts chapter 6. Okay, and we stayed with him. Uh, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. I'm of the opinion that this Philip was not the Philip of Acts chapter 8 who went to Samaria. Uh, but I recognize there are different opinions. And the majority opinion probably think he is the same Philip. But I think the Philip of Acts chapter 8 who went to Samaria um, is Philip the apostle. <laughs> But uh, it, it doesn't really matter in this quiet wife scheme of things. Uh, but nevertheless, this Philip, they entered the house of this Philip, the evangelist, who was, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. I think that's probably uh, a way of saying, hey, my daughters are eligible. <laughs> and they're even more eligible because they can prophesy. So if you've got any single guys among you, Verse 10, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. Here we have this again. This is how the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. You see, now... Paul has met Agabus before. I don't know if you remember that. But 14 years earlier than this, in Acts chapter 11, we have Agabus. Remember, right shortly after Paul's conversion, he was really young ho for the gospel, and he goes down to Jerusalem to meet the disciples for this first time, and they kind of ignore him. And Barnabas comes alongside of him and he tries to encourage him, and, and then he's preaching in Jerusalem, and and the Judaizers uh, try, try to kill Paul. So the, the Christians, the church, uh, hustle him up to Caesarea. And uh, he was supposed to stay there, but he went home to Tarsus. Almost like he was defeated. Wondering, what should I do? And then Barnabas went up to, to Tarsus and found him and took him to Antioch. 
And they spent a whole year teaching the church there in Antioch. So that's the background here. But while they were in Antioch, then this Agabus came up from Jerusalem. And uh, he prophesied that there was going to be a famine in Judea. So the church in Jerusalem was going to suffer a lot because of the famine. So the church in Antioch then decides, well, okay, we're going to make gather a collection. Um, and um, we're going to send it to the church in Jerusalem so that our Christian brothers and sisters will have, uh, won't be, suffer as much as, as they need to be without our help. And they appointed Paul and Barnabas to go to Jerusalem and deliver it. But that was because of the prophecy of this Agabus. Well, here's Agabus again. And the, in this dramatic style of the Old Testament prophets like Ezekiel, uh, he takes Paul's belt, he ties his own hands and his feet, and he announces that the Holy Spirit says, this is how the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentile. Wow, when you hear that, a specific prophecy about what's going to happen to Paul when he gets there, how would you feel? What would you say to your best friend and beloved pastor? Don't go. That's exactly what they did. So again, it's not the Spirit telling Paul, don't go. Through Agabus, he's saying, this is what's going to happen when you get there. But I still want you there. That's my will. Agabus, Agabus did not interpret the prophecy or say whether Paul should or shouldn't go to Jerusalem, but his friends did. Look at verse 12. It says, when we heard this, we and the people urged him not to go. So who's the we? Okay, this is Luke. So it would be Luke and Timothy and Erastus and, and that whole list of men that are, that are listed in chapter 20, verse 4. These are the traveling companions of Paul. Yeah, these are the, the fellow missionaries. It's his missionary team. Plus the, the we then are the people in Philip's house. So it would be Philip himself. Maybe even his daughters. And maybe they even prophesied. Who knows? And anybody else is staying in the house. And they're all urging Paul. Paul, if you go, this is what's going to happen. It's kind of like Scrooge. And after the third ghost of Christmas... He says, tell me, are these the things that will be or the things that might be? So in other words, if I change, it won't happen. But if I don't change, it will. And it's like they're looking at this and saying, is this prophecy something that will definitely happen? If we can get Paul not to go, it's not going to happen. Well, it just seemed like there were so many obstacles and people against Paul going to Jerusalem that you, you begin thinking, Paul, oh, why aren't you listening to these people? I mean, maybe this is God's way of telling you that it's not as well. Do we get that sometimes? You know, we, we make plans for things. When we, sometimes we were convinced that this is God's will, that we step out in this direction. And, and it almost seems unreasonable or illogical to a lot of people and so all of these people family and friends they're coming back and saying don't do it because they don't understand we're going to draw a principle from this at the end look at verse 13 in verse 13 Paul acknowledged that they were tearing him apart emotionally it was one thing when the Jews were interrupting his plans with plots to kill him and, and the boats were taking so long to get anywhere and uh, he's getting frustrated but now his friends and the Christians were telling him not to go. And this reminds us of when Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Do you remember that? And his disciples were urging him, don't go! But if Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem, there'd be no salvation. He had to go. We see that in Luke 9, 51. It tells us that Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem because he knew it was God's will. And it's the same with Paul. Paul, with greater resolve, at the end of verse 13 says, For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to, the, to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He's so convinced this is the Lord's will that it didn't matter to him what would happen. He knew that God wanted him there, so he had to be there. Whether it was death or imprisonment or anything else. But he was ready to face anything 
to be obedient to God's will. Now look at verse 14. Paul's companions had to concede that it was God's will. You see that there? They had to concede. Now some people think that they're just giving up. Okay, Paul, if you think it's God's will, go. But I think that the language leads more to the fact that they really knew that it was God's will. And so they're going to let him go. How did Martin Luther and the Apostle Paul know God's will? I think it's because they knew God's word. And when you know God's word, then you know what to do. When you know what God teaches about relationships, then you know who you can date and who you can't date. And who you can marry and who you can't marry. When you know God's word about righteousness, then you know who to vote for in an election and who not to vote for. When to speak up and when it's time to be silent. When, when you know God's word, you know what his will is. Knowing God's word is not to give you enough knowledge so that you and win a Bible trivia. <laughs> you still got a Bible trivia, games? No, oh, no, you didn't have Bible trivia. We had a Bible trivia. We have it now. You, you have it now. Okay. Right? It would be great to win that. I got a lot of knowledge. <laughs> I, I know the facts. But the, the, the goal of knowing God's Word is not to be able to win a Bible trivia, but it is to know God. It, it's to know what He expects of us to know how to live in this world, and to know what the next world is all about. When we know that, then it, everything falls into place. And guess what? God's will is naturally revealed. You don't have to seek it. You just have to know the truth. So there are a number of lessons here. And I'm going to give you five lessons quickly. The first lesson is that uh, God reveals His will to those who know His word. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. It comes out of the text. Paul knew the gospel. And he knew what had to be said. He knew what had to be done. And he knew God's will because of it. The second thing is, uh, lesson here is that others think they know God's will for you. When it really is their will. Sometimes we have to be careful and, and not let others persuade our confidence of what God will. You know, back in 1997, I think it was 97, that's the year you went to Jamaica, right, Tim? Tim is 15. I was thinking about this the whole time. We're letting him go to Jamaica by himself. The family members are telling us, you're crazy. Don't let him go. In fact, some of our family wouldn't even support him because they didn't think that he should be going. Well, that was their will. It wasn't God's will. that They were not willing to trust him to God. It was also their own fear and their love for Tim, just like Paul's friends. So we need to expect those kinds of things in some of the decisions that, we, that, that God asked us to do. Do you think that the families of a lot of the missionaries wanted them to go to the mission fields? <clears throat> Where almost the day that they got there, they were killed. It's like, waste. Thirdly, um, God reveals His will in His Word and confirms it in your heart by the Spirit. There's a story of a lady that, uh, that when her boyfriend asked her for her hand in marriage and she said give me a week and I'll have an answer for you and she took a week off work and took her Bible went to a secluded place and sought the truth of his word and then she came back with a decision she knew God's will by his word and the spirit confirms it into our hearts the fourth thing is uh, God's will is accomplished through God's timing. Again, we believe that God is sovereign, that he has a plan for everything and everybody, right? 
but it's not a dictatorship. It's not uh, um, what was the what's the word that I put on that chart a while back? It's not fatalism. So that so that we don't have a choice at all. God's just going to do. It. We have choices. We make the right choices when we know His word. But God's timing. Why are all these delays happening on the ships and in the ports? Because he wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem when Paul wanted to be there. He arrived in Jerusalem when God wanted him to be in Jerusalem. We don't have to worry about those kinds of details, do we? We don't worry about those things. You know, when I was thinking of going to Bible college, I, I, initially I wanted to be a missionary. And do you know what I, I thought? Hey, if I go to Bible college, that means I won't be a missionary for at least four years. But if I go to um, uh, this particular mission organization, I can be a missionary in a year. I can fast track it. See, sometimes we try to manipulate that. And I tried to fast track it. Remember, Bird, we drove up there? And, yeah. and uh, do you know what their answer to me was? You're not ready. You need Bible college. <laughs> I had to go. And then in my junior year of Bible college, what happens? I get sick. And I lose half a year. It means, means i got to wait another whole year, come back and repeat the second half of the third year, and then go to my... So now it's no longer four years, but it's five years. <coughs> because God's timing, He always works out. We don't have to worry about the timing aspect. We follow his will. I had no choice but to go to Bible college. Because it was confirmed through his word. It was confirmed through the spirit of my own heart. And I was doing everything I could to get there. But God was in charge of the time. <clears throat> Fifth. Knowing God's will is not a mystery. It's not a mystery. I mean, really, in simplicity... Knowing God's will is just obeying His word. <laughs> Learn about Him. Live like Christ. Be a witness in this world. That's really the simplicity of it. God has the details of our lives planned in His will. But He reveals them to us. Confirms them in our hearts by His Spirit. And He brings them about in His timing. So it's not really a mystery. Often it begins with that desire in our hearts. And, and he confirms it through his word. Augustine's advice was this. And, and, and if, you, if you don't put it into the context, you misunderstand it. But his advice was, love God and do what you want. Just think about that for a second. Love God and do what you want. What he's saying is that those who love God will know what God's will is and they will do it. Because what do Christians want to do? We want to follow God's will. So doing what you want is doing what God's will is for your life. Well, those are some lessons we get out of this. Here's some four very quickly practical um, reminders. First reminders, let's seek uh, good advisors. No, I mean, I'm sure that Paul did ask uh, Luke and Timothy and others what they thought, right? And it was only as they were going along and they were getting closer to this that their love was, uh, he began to um, view their, their point. Seek good advisors. Seek godly people who do know God's word. Spend, number two, spend time in God's word. Okay, if God reveals his word, his will through his word, then where do you find God's will? In his word. It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's not rocket science here. <laughs> Number three, realize that God's will may not be what you want. And Caesarea, when they finally realize, okay. What we want is we want Paul not to go. But when they finally realize that this that God's will is not always what we want, then we can accept it and we answer the same way 
then let the will of the Lord be done. So this is part of the reason why we pray, um, if it is your will. You can ask for things, and uh, we, it's good to add, if it is your will. And the fourth and last one, um, if you know what God wants you to do, then you got to do it. That's pretty simple. And probably the hardest part of God's will is the obedience. Because when we start moving towards that, we start getting this hunger and desire to do something. It gets harder to be obedient. But keep on being obedient. Well, one last observation before I end. Do you know that Agabus got it all wrong? His prophecy was wrong? He, he, he said that the Jews in Jerusalem would bind Paul and deliver him to the Gentiles. Okay? When in fact, this is why I wanted to read the latter context, when in fact, it was the Jews that were beating Paul up, and who came to his rescue? The Romans did. And the Romans bound Paul and rescued him from the Jews. That's what really happened. Well, I think there's a little bit of a caution there to be caution of people who come to you and say, I have a word of prophecy for you. It comes from God. <clears throat> Very cautious. God doesn't reveal his word through so-called prophets. He reveals his will for you through the word and the witness of the spirit to your own heart. Well, that's what it means to follow God's will. And I hope that starts it for you today. And if not today, for days in the future, when you're seeking God to make decisions in your life.